All right. So where last we um, where last we started, uh, or rather where last we ended, was page seventy five of um, of Mitchell and Robinson. Um, as with um, the first day of syntax reading um, from Mitchell and Robinson, this is mostly. Um, expansion or kind of fuller detail, recapitulation, to use the word from Old English, um, from Old English syntax that we've already talked about, recapitulation of stuff that you have already um, studied in shorter form in Baker. So beginning at the bottom of page 75 uh, with adjective clauses, um, numbers one, two, um, and so on, this next section, I guess section 162 it is, pages 75 to 77, um, recapitulates that Old English has two ways of forming relative clauses with the inde indeclinable particle fe, which we've seen um, sort of from the very beginning, um, and or with um, a case of the relative pronoun um, with or without fe. There is some interesting um, uh, account, there's an interesting account from Mitchell and Robinson as to how um, the alternation of se and se, 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 that um, tends to work. Namely, um, the indeclinable particle is very common when the relative is the subject, fairly often when the clause, uh, sorry, when the relative is the object, and only occasionally um, functions by itself in the genitive or dative. Um, and in, in, the last, in those last examples, it's probably because um, fed, because it's indeclinable, offered too little information. Um, and so authors felt it helpful um, to include the form of se as well. Um, so the summary, top of page 77, um, number five, um, the Old English relatives are the indeclinable particle fe, to which the personal pronoun can be added to remove ambiguities of case, either alone or followed by the indeclinable particle. Um, that is, I think that's the main important thing there, except for the bottom of page 77, number five. So that, the, the Old English word fat, <laughs> often combines antecedent and relative pronoun. That is to say, Old English will often use the single word that, where in modern English we might say that which. Um, so the that um, is the antecedent, and the which is the relative pronoun in that, um, in that situation. So Mitchell and Robinson that say it must then be translated what, um, I don't consider that to be true. I'm perfectly happy with that which, since that functions, um, that functions the same in modern English. But you can see uh, a good example there in the Old English at the bottom of 78. Hey, have to thach, ye forthod, that, he his fran, ye he. He had, however, uh, done what or that which. There's really a sort of two thats kind of embedded in that one that at the bottom, um, that which he promised his lord. Um, and then I thought it was sort of funny, number seven in the middle of 79. Attempts have been made to lay down the rules which governed the use of various relative pronouns in Old English. They have not succeeded, largely because the vital clue of intonation is denied to us. Um, so, And then as for I, the, the difference between definite and indefinite adjective clauses is not um, really material to our purposes. Um, just note that the mood um, of these clauses, the mood of the declined verb in these relative clauses um, can be either indicative or subjunctive. Um, typically, it's indicative, um, but the subjunctive may happen in these, um, in these listed cases. Um, and here, it's worth remembering in general what we saw in Baker about the, um, about the flexibility, variability, um, sometimes the semantic illegibility, frankly, of the difference between the indicative um, and the subjunctive any, in any particular sentence. Um, any questions about those, um, those adjective clauses on the first few pages um, of the reading? All right, so adverb clauses, um, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of detail in here um, on pages 90, sorry, 81 through 93. I will highlight what I take to be the most important bits 
um, and then happily take questions on any of the rest of it. Um, so again, most of this is recapitulation um, and some expansion of what um, we've already talked about. Um, paragraph or section rather um, 167 on the multiple kinds of conjunction. Um, don't worry about this too much. It's a little, it's a little complicated. Um, the, the, the blank lines for numbers four and numbers for number four and five are basically that's Mitchell and Robinson's attempt to indicate that Old English has options, namely four and five. I'm not quite sure why they chose to put the blank ones in the middle of their enumerated list. That seems sort of odd to me, but, and it may have to you as well, but nonetheless. Um, basically, these are cases of where, because modern English relatives um, uh, do not have a uh, case, um, we simply can't use uh, the word that in as many ways as Old English can. Um, so specifically, um, Numbers four and five, we have um, uh, in the examples on page 82, um, we, ha we see that this is, this is creative use, creative Old English use of the genitive. So, so thasthe um, is a possible, uh, it has nothing to do with possession. This is not about the genitive in its normal possessive sense. It's simply an idiomatic expression um, so that. Um, and similarly, uh, with number five, to the extent that where um, the genitive is used uh, to indicate to the extent that. And you can see this um, schematized at the top of page 83, where you have the modern English equivalent um, on the left, um, and then the Old English uh, example of how that is expressed on the right, where you have thas, the, and thas, dot, 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 that, um, with simply no equivalent in modern English. This will not be on the exam. I'm not going to use um, genitive. Um, I'm not going to use genitives in this way. But it is something that you should be aware of as you're, um, as you're translating. Um, so that is that. Is that. Um, Non-prepositional conjunctions. So paragraph 168 um, is important um, because they're calling these, um, so this is, so they're, Mitchell and Robinson are emphasizing the fact that all of these words, ar, bouton, yif, nefne, um, nu, all of those words can indicate, can be conjunctions in the sense of indicating an entire dependent clause with uh, subject and conjugated verb. Nevertheless, um, bear in mind that many of these words, um, if you go back to chapter 10 in Baker, and you don't have to right now, but many of these words can also be straight up adverbs. Um, so if, if this is the distinction between um, uh, table, yeah, table 10.1, which are Baker's list of adverbs, and table 10.3, uh, which is his list of subordinating conjunctions. Um, so just bear in mind that the same word can serve multiple functions. Um, although, uh, page, uh, sorry, section 169 um, indicates that they often have, um, they often, they often, um, they often do include a, a, a fe or a form of se, that, so. And we, so we've, t we've talked about this phenomenon in um, multiple mostly in the context of forthom the or forthom. Um, but we can see that this, gets, this happens with um, other prepositions as well. Um, so the long example uh, given by Mitchell and Robinson is the most common example, that of forthom, or as they, they put it, fortham. Um, those are interchangeable, remember. But you, it is also possible to have um, these additional uh, cases of prepositions functioning like this, functioning as uh, conjunctions um, on pages uh, in 171, section 171, pages 85 and 86. Um, I would draw attention in particular until to, uh, to off, often off that, um, toe, 
so off fat is uh, the fat is the accusative. So off plus the accusative. Um, toe with the dative or instrumental, um, meaning to the end that. Um, and toe with the genitive, meaning to the extent that or so that. That's that same. The last one of those um, is analogous to the genitive, the genitive uses um, on page 83, the fast the and fast fat. Um, again, this is not something I'm going to be testing on the exam, but it is something that you that will be will be seeing. In fact, we have already seen instances of this um, kind of pattern in the translation homework. Um, and since that's from now on really the most part of your homework um, and the most part of your preparation, it's important to be aware of. Okay. Um, I apologize for not saying that I didn't expect you to do uh, their little exercise in analysis in paragraph in, in section 172. Did anyone actually try that, by the way? Is that was that? Um, did anyone see that and think, oh, I think I need to? You don't have to answer, but like anyone who did who did try their strength, as um, as Mitchell and Robinson say, I'm sort of I'm I'm kind of interested in how it went. Maybe we should talk through A together. Um, on fourth on itch the babioda, that thu do, swa itch yelifa, that thu willa, that thu, the thissa world finger, to them ye amitia, swa thu oftus maya, that thu thon a wisdom, the the god sailda, thar thar thu hina, the fast on maya. The fasta. Oh my gosh, that's really complicated. So let's um, let's actually take a break on that. Let's finish um, what the actual homework was and uh, pre and going over the mock exam and doing the translation. And then if we have time, uh, which seems unlikely, we'll come all the way back um, to and forth on and forth on each day, but it is But it is kind of fun and um, and a good way of uh, kind of a good form of aerobics, I suppose. Um, all right, clauses of place, time, all of these different kinds of adverbial clauses on, um, on the following pages through to page 93. Um, the, most important, uh, the most important of these really are at the top of page 90. So comparisons involving as. Um, here, what I want to uh, draw your attention to is simply how many different ways, um, no fewer than six, that M Mitchell and Robinson are able to list, how many ways Old English has to express um, uh, comparisons uh, with th that in English would be expressed as as, as including, note, F, fast. So you're, you're, you're hopefully get, getting a, a sense of a theme, which is that genitive thas can serve some sort of, to modern ears, unidiomatic purposes um, in Old English. Um, and often this is related to um, extent. So I suspect that the way in which um, this comparison, this at this 2F at the top of page 90, I suspect that the way that this evolved, um, or that it's related at least, I can't speak to the temporal evolution, but that it's related at least to the same um, thas uh, of, um, of extent um, in on pages 82 and 83 that we talked about um, at the very beginning of this section. Um, so that's one of the things to be aware of um, in, this, in this long list of clause, clauses. The other thing I would draw attention to is actually number five on page 92. Um, so this is, um, this is the two words, um, bouton and nemne, which, can all, which is often also spelled nefne. Um, sometimes nympha, although I've never, I can't actually remember seeing an example of that, but I trust Mitchell and Robinson that it exists. Um, and this, these, these words have two distinct but related meanings. One is unless, and the other is except that. Um, and usually the subjunctive indicates unless, um, and the indicative, and the indicative um, except that. Um, and for parataxis, we'll talk more about parataxis actually when we get to um, the next uh, reading 
four of Cadman's hymn um, after the exam, because parataxis is a very typically um, uh, poetic uh, representation, um, or it's a poetic style. It's a very it's a stylistic device that's especially associated with poetry, and um, Cadman is the sort of quasi-legendary first poet in Old English who's um, uh, singing of the very first poem about Genesis is um, the topic of Bede's account of the poet Cadman, um, which we will turn to after, um, after the exam. So we're finishing up today as far as we get in the preface to Genesis is as far as we get, um, and then we'll finish up uh, sorry, we'll finish up on, on Monday, rather, um, and then turn to Bede's account of the poet Cadman. Um, so start your, um, start your translating um, with, uh, the preface, with, with the preface to Genesis um, and get as far as you can um, through the assigned um, uh, account of Cadman um, in Michelin Robinson. It's actually also in, um, it's actually also in Baker, um, so that we have kind of like two different, it can be interesting to look at how two di the same text is treated by two different um, editors slash um, textbook writers. Um, all right, any questions about the, that quick and dirty overview of pages 81 through, uh, through 90, um, through 90, whatever it was, 95, 96. Like I say, we'll come back to, uh, we'll come back to, we'll come back to parataxis shortly. Um, so I apologize um, for the tardiness of the, um, I hope everybody saw um, the, um, the announcement, I apologize, I thought I had set Canvas to automatically release the mock exam key um, at Saturday, um, and I thought it had done so, and I, I didn't hear, I didn't get any emails asking that it do, that it be, that, that this be released, and so I just then didn't notice until this morning early when I was um, having insomnia <laughs> that it hadn't been, um, and so I apologize for that. Um, so. The way we're going to do this um, is since the whole first three sections of the exam should there should be uh, there should be no questions about since the first section is literally reproduce uh, paradigms the second section is vocab you either know it or you don't um, and the third section is the grammatical principles to which I have already given you the answers and it's simply a matter of learning them and reproducing them um, we will spend. Uh, all of our time today simply on um, the site translation. And as I said in the announcement, um, what I'd like to uh, ask folks to do is to take us through um, their account of how they worked through the problem. Because basically, these I think of these sentences as a little bit analogous to problem sets um, in, your, in your technical subjects, right? They're all sort of puzzles that should be both hard but ultimately solvable, right? So I'm going to let, uh, let you all look over um, the answer key um, while I put the sentences up on the board um, for better uh, for easier kind of diagramming and discussion. Um, and then after I've done that, we'll come back to, um, I'll come back to take volunteers um, for, for the particular sentences, okay? So look over this uh, real quick, formulate your questions and also your, um, uh, and also your accounts, um, and we'll, we'll come back in just a moment.
So we'll just start with, we'll start with just these first two, all right? Um, Thabar sagodaman hringas in thas drishnas hayala. Um, so who wants to take us through kind of how they, how they, how they approached this, this first sentence? Yeah, Ritam? Okay, so like the first thing you see, see is the say, so probably, yeah, so say godaman is probably the subject. Why is it not just probably the subject? Uh, well, well, say is uh, always nominative. Exactly. So, so, um, so this has to be the subject. It is not just probably the, but it, well, at least the say is. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, good. Yeah, and you can also like parse the prepositional phrase in thes drukhnes kale. Yep. In the large hall or into the large hall because kale can be either accusative or dative. Good, excellent. Um, so in my translation, I say, well, to bear, I mean, there's a kind of implicit motion, but I'm not going to quibble with in or into. Like, that's totally fine. However you translated, that is not, yeah, so is not a problem. Some time to figure out that the ha meant then and not like some kind of accusative object. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. How did you ultimately come to the conclusion that this is then and not? Uh, a demonstrative. Well, I think it was the word order. Yeah. Because the verb is second and like the uh, subject comes after that, the first thing it should probably be like an adverb. Good. Something. Yeah, absolutely. So two two elements, two two aspects of the sentence tell you that this um, has to mean then and not be uh, a demonstrative. One is that we've already got our subject. Um, so the thaw can't be related to the subject. Um, and then the other is, as you say, this typical word order where the first element can be sometimes the subject or an adverb here. And since we already have the subject over here, it's likelier that this is the adverb um, so that the conjugated verb can stay in that second position. Very good. Any... Um, Oh, why is this um, why is this ending an a? Uh, weak adjective. Good. Weak adjective. Weak, weak adjective ending after a form of se, that seo. Very good. Um, any questions about that one? Yeah. Well, in the footnote below, it mentioned that ring could be either ring or a suit of armor. Yeah. I guess I just couldn't really parse out which one would make more sense in that. Oh, yeah, either one is fine. Um, it's, 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 I, I translated rings just because it seemed a little likelier that someone was bearing a treasure that was sort of easily portable rings rather than like a whole cartload full of, full of ring mail. Um, but absolutely, it could be ring mail. Um, so you can imagine, um, you know, there's been some battle and we've stripped the slain um, of their, um, of their, of their ring mail, you're going to get the word order word, uh, sorry, word order word hoard uh, word wow. Wow is a wonderful and very old English word. Um, wow means um, the slaughter of the battlefield, very specifically. Um, and it's cognate with Old Norse val. Um, so valhalla, the hall, is the hall of the slain, the hall of the slaughter um, on the battlefield. So you can imagine a situation in which there's all this wow on the battlefield, um, and they decide to strip the wow of its ringas so that we can, you know, but, but you know, either way is fine. Um, good question. Any others? Notice this very typical, um, I told you I would test this, and I have. Right? We have the preposition in, we have the object of the preposition, and then the dative. Um, my chicken scratching has, has made this, um, has sort of obscured this a little bit. So, right, preposition, genitive, object. This, this typical word order that we've seen in a gazillion prepositional um, phrases. Yeah, Ritam? I think you meant to write genitive there. Oh, thank you. Oh God, it's been, it's been recorded for posterity now. Um, yes, this is correct. Genitive. Thank you, Ritam. Um, all right. Any other questions with this one? 
This is pretty typical. There are a couple of sentences on the exam um, that kind of replicate basically this pattern, a version of this pattern um, with different words, okay? So I'll leave that up for right now. Um, let's move over here to sentence two. Tha we gone shold on gone Totham Aldra on him Hira Hringas. We're back to uh, oh Helmas. Sorry, in this case it's Helmas, right? Could have been either. Um, Helmas. The Hringas have already been born into the hall. Um, all right, who wants to take us through this one? Lambert? OK, so um, we, can, we can have the va, which I figured after doing all the reading, but probably then. <laughs> OK, yeah. Um, I, when I first tried this without looking up anything, yep. I vaguely remembered we gone being weak, a weak masculine noun, I think. Mm -hmm. And I saw the on on the end of the shoulder, on, so Good. I figured it was like, like should or, or shall, like, like the, there's an obligation. Good, good, exactly. So shailed on is the past, right, of the, the past tense of the preterite present verb shulon, which is on your list of, of, uh, of preter preterite present verbs that you need to know. Remember this all-important list on page 81? Um, so kunon, magon, moton, shulon, and witon, um, plus don and gon. Um, so yeah, so very good. So you see the plural ending of on, um, and then that helps you, helps, that plural ending helps you disambiguate this often ambiguous an ending. Very good, keep going. And then I saw gone, which I figured might be the verb in that section because of a totham elder, so. Okay. That was like one thing on its own. Okay, yep. And then, and then on him hira helma fiavan. <coughs> so the him I assumed was elder because the hira was, I think it was genitive plural. Good. Hira helma, so I figured that was like helmets. Mm -hmm. So that hira probably went on we gone because mm -hmm. that's the only other plural thing in there. Good, excellent, excellent. Because with, this is singular. Um, this is ambiguous, but if it refers back to Aldra, then it is also singular. Right, so whose helmets? Um, well, in all likelihood, I mean, it's kind of got to be the Wigons. Yeah, good. And then Yevon, so like, I guess onto him their helmets gave. Yeah, and, and to, so this is a, um, so what's, what's happening with the, what's happening with the verbs in this sentence? Because we, um, we have actually three verbs in the sentence. Like how, who, what's, what is governing what? Which, what, what verbs are governing what? And how do they all, and how do they all piece together? Yeah, Joshua. Uh, shield on is the conjugated one, and the other two are infinitives. Exactly. Both of which are governed by the conjugated form of the verb. Exactly. So. Either then or the, <laughs> it's technically ambiguous, but it's pro I intended it to be the. Um, so the warriors had to, because it's the past tense, so had to go to the Lord and give him their helmets. All right. Um, and this is very typical, this construction, whereby a single conjugated verb can govern multiple infinitives, just like in modern English, um, where we could say something very comparable to that and have it be basically idiomatic. Yeah? Meeting-wise, is that something that usually happens? Like, after a battle, you just return? <laughs> after what, sorry? After, a, I'm just, when I was reading the, the sentence, I was just, Thinking in my mind, is that something common that warriors did? They just returned everything they brought into battle to the Lord, or is that just what the sense? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, I think that is um, actually 
honestly, really, it's, it would be much more likely to be the other way around, that the Lord would give rings to the warriors rather than the, the warriors um, giving rings to the Lord. Because a ring giver is, in fact, a very typical kenning, or sorry, a, well, helmet, a distributor of treasure is a co common, um, common uh, kenning for a Lord. Yeah, Alyssa? Is there any possibility to read this with the more metaphorical meaning, like, sense of the warriors had to go to the Lord and give them their protection, as in, like, yeah. their, their fealty? Oh. Like, I, like, yeah. they're giving, like, like a symbolic, they're giving him their, their protection, I know, is the other reading of Helma. Yes, of the other reading of Helm. Pledging that they will protect the Lord, which seems like a reasonable reading of Helm. I would totally accept that. Um, I would totally accept that. I think in the plural, it, as a, as a kind of... <sighs> Gotcha. I'm not sure how, how, how idiomatic that would be um, as a sort of plural kind of presentation, but it's totally grammatically possible, and I would accept that and give full points on the exam. Good question. Um, and I love, by the way, that you all are reading actively for like the sense of the sentences and also for metaphorical possibilities, because this will, be, um, this will all serve you in very good stead uh, when we get to the poetry. Um, all right. Any questions on number two? So let's take a look then at number three, which I'll put up while. Uh, All right, what have we got? Um, what have we got here? Who wants to take us through their account of the of the sentence? Yeah, Alyssa. Um, yeah. So uh, here again, we have um, "thaw," meaning then at the beginning. Hmm? Um, Eudon is the past plural of to be, so then went. Um, uh, Sela, which at the time I couldn't remember. Yeah. Uh, I could tell with a weak adjective, it has been forked up. Uh, <laughs> uh, Erla is the singular of nominative of, uh, or it can be a lot of things, but it's, it's probably singular nominative masculine, I believe. It could also be plural other things. Yep, yep. So it definitely means uh, lord or lord. Okay, yep, um, good. Hira yestalon. Um, Hira is a uh, genitive plural. Yestalon is um, retainer or retainers. Good. Disambiguated. Um, and to yesechanne uh, uh -huh. is the inflected infinitive for um, to see or to visit. Excellent. Um, so if you put it all together, you get then the something lords, which I have since looked up to be the the many yes. of the lords. Yes, exactly. Um, when to visit their retainers. Excellent, excellent. So very good job. Um, so the disambiguation process that um, that we just heard is exactly the kind of process that you want to be doing on the exam, um, sort of in real time. So we've got a. So what is the most um, helpfully disambiguated part of the sentence, it's really this, right? Because you know that this... And here. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I mean, and this too, right? There are, there are multiple... Um, di there are multiple unambiguous forms. Um, but in terms of the, um, the subject verb that we're always sort of looking for first, this conjugated verb um, is the easiest. And we know that it's plural. So we know that we need a plural subject to go with it, right? And this fella Erla, here what I'm testing your ability is, the ability I'm testing here is your ability, is, is <laughs> that if we could do outtakes. Um, here what I'm testing is your knowledge of the partitive genitive, right? Because you have many of Earls. That's what's going on here. Um, and this partitive genitive, is 
all over the place in Old English, but very unidiomatic in Modern English, which is precisely why I'm testing it. Okay. Um, there's actually some question in my mind. I've used the plural ending here because I don't want this to be a trick exam. <laughs> there's some question in my mind as to whether would they ever have used a singular verb because this is technically singular? I don't think so. I think there was always a sense that, that because the, the, the fullness of the subject is really plural, the verb form would be plural. And certainly for the purposes of the exam, that is what I will do. OK? Um, was there a, d a debate about this very question going on? I would, I'm curious because like, I think that's a really interesting, I might have to look it up in, the, in, that, in my giant like, two volume syntax book. But um, all right. Um, so, and then the last part that I wanted to emphasize was that this an ending, which is one of our most ambiguous, you kind of have to piece together last. So often what you do with an an is going to have to be kind of like process of elimination once you've pieced everything else out. Yeah? Thela doesn't decline, right? Correct. So could it in theory be the companion seeking the Lord? Well, you'd have, to in, you'd have to deal with this Hira, because Hira has to refer, has to connect to Yastalon. Um, so, it, so their companions, if you don't have an the and the only antecedent of, of this Hira, the only possible antecedent, because the only preceding noun, is Erla. So I don't, I can't figure out a way that you would make that work. Does that make sense? OK, yeah. Because if, if you make this the subject of the sentence, then Hira has nothing to refer back to. Well, you could still make Hira. It would be Hira Yisalon in the subject, I think, is what they were. Yeah. So then there, then what does Fela Erla do? Can it be an object? Can you just then their companions this might be a syntax. went to seek many of Earl's. Is that your, is that your idea? That would never be what it means <laughs> based on Old English word order. But if you could articulate that grammatical logic, I would still give you points. I would still give you the, po the maximum points because I don't think I can figure out an ironclad reason why it couldn't grammatically be true. Um, but in terms of like your knowledge of Old English, that's never what it will mean. Does that clarify? Yeah. OK. Yeah. So. In some sense, and we're actually going to get to, um, but I'm really glad you asked because there's another kind of comparably, actually less unlikely, but still pretty unlikely alternate translation of number five that we'll get to in a moment. So I'm really glad you asked the question. Um, I'll puzzle through. There may be, there may be a, 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 a reason in there that I'm not seeing live, unscripted, why your version can't be right, but off the top of my head, I think that the indeclinable nature of this and the weak nature of this noun sort of combine to make it theoretically possible, although basically it's sort of like one of those. I, I would compare it to, so you, do, you, do you know the famous um, example, time fly, the famous sentence, time flies like an arrow? What's the time flies like an arrow thing, Kenneth? It's like, I guess you follow it by saying fruit flies like a banana. <laughs> right. Like, you don't know where time is like, or flies as a verb or a noun, I guess. Right. Idiomatically, time flies like an arrow means time proceeds in the same way that an arrow proceeds. Um, but theoretically, um, it could mean measure the speed of flies in the same way that you measure the speed of an arrow. Time flies like an arrow. It could theoretically mean that flies of a particular kind, time flies, are fond of an arrow, right? There are any, I think there are actually sort of like eight possible meanings that um, this linguist kind of disambiguated, all of which except one are kind of hilariously improbable, but theoretically possible. I think your version maybe be, um, belongs in that illustrious list. Um, and I will, I will try to get back to you on that. Um, so good question. Yeah, Lambert? Uh, I was just wondering, is it because Yisalon had that on ending that the, in, like the infinitive is to? Yes, yes, to yes, or is that just? To is always, you're always going to have a to for the inflected infinitive. 
Um, yeah, and actually, I spelled it with an A because I didn't want to um, mess you up because you know the you know the infinitive as yasechan, um, but or yasechan. But often we've seen inflected infinitives where that A has resolved to an E to yosechene um, as opposed to ane. Um, so on the exam, I'll give you the um, the form as it um, most kind of properly exists. But it's worth knowing that inflected infinitives, as we've seen, can sometimes have an E-N-N-E -N -N -E ending. Good question. Others? All right. Um, Al manakin shall sona echa drishtan drishten luvian. Um, so who wants to? Take us through what the um, what the most versus least ambiguous parts of the sentence are. How how you kind of mapped your way through it. Um, yeah, Mike. So shall good is what third person. Presence uh, indicative, right? Excellent. Should or must. Yes, much more likely must. Um, I mean, shall with a strong sense of like normative obligation. Um, so, yeah. Um, and as, as you could probably tell, I was trying to inhabit. Um, the mind of some like old English person when I was coming up with these sentences. Um, so because I mean it's 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 this is why this is one of the many reasons I have you memorize all of word hoard. It tells you so much about a culture what the most commonly appearing words in their poetic corpus is. Right, like you are going to get so many more words for warrior. You thought Wiga was it? Oh no. So many words. One, because right in an alliterating language, when you have an alliterative poetic tradition and you're talking about warriors a lot, it's very handy to have lots of words for warrior that all start with different letters. So you can just plug, the, it's like plug and play um, into any line of Old English heroic poetry. Um, so anyway, all that back to shall. This is a totally um, unambiguous word and it's wonderful and it means must. So very good. Um, what else? So you have kuhn and drichten. Yeah. They're both uh, could be accusative or nominative. Good. So these words, are, by contrast, are ambiguous um, because they're strong masculine nouns for which the nominative and accusative forms are identical. But we have thone, which we know is accusative. Excellent. Seems to be agreeing with Drichten. Good. Which means Kuhn should be the subject. Excellent. So by process of elimination, as well as normative SVO word order, Kuhn has to be the subject. Very good. Um, so then you have mana Kuhn, which is like mankind. It's like mankind, but what is it technically grammatically? The race or kind of Men. Very good. And this is also very typical Old English word order. So this manna, this N-A ending, is a, is a typical um, genitive plural, uh, strong genitive plural ending. Um, and this same, this same um, a version of the same kind of preposition genitive, object of preposition, like that pattern of word order in Old English um, finds a parallel in this, where you have an adjective, um, its noun, and then a partitive genitive kind of sandwiched in the middle. But the point is you get the same version or a similar version of this like jump over the genitive that's, that's sandwiched in the middle that you have with um, here in genitive object of the preposition. OK. 
good. Um, all of the race of men yeah. shall move beyond the love of Yep, yep. Yeah. The eternal Lord. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and this is, again, very typical word order where we've shunted um, the infinitive off to the end of the dependent clause. Very comparably to what happened, what happened over here with Sheldon dot, 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 Yivan. I could just as easily have put the gone, by the way, at the end here. Um, and in some ways, that maybe would be more idiomatic. But I'm actually kind of like go running with the whole uh, variable word order. Yeah. Is is a sh like a infinitive that's been shoved to the end like that more likely to be an inflexible infinitive, or is it kind of both? Yeah, I think it's equally likely to be both. Um, because I, I, I feel like we've seen more inflected infinitives at the end. It's, 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 you're probably right. It's probably even more common with inflected infinitives. But I would still say it's over, well over 50%, even with um, just plain old um, infinitives at the ends of clauses. Good question. Yeah? When you have a conjugated verb governing two infinitives, will they ever, do you ever have like one inflected and one not inflected? Or are they generally going to be both? You're, only, I mean, I'm hesitant to say you would, you could never have such a thing, but it would be atypical, and I wouldn't give it to you on an exam. Yeah, good question. Yeah. I guess when I was first translating the sentence, I thought it was like, like all of mankind will love the Lord eternally, because I remember eternal, but also the eternal being. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, the reason that it's probably not in this case is just that it would be odd to sandwich an adverb in between uh, a demonstrative and its, and its noun. Um, but you can, I mean, but it is theoretically possible. Um, and this is actually, I realize now in retrospect, Hcha is a weird word because it doesn't, it's kind of indeclinable. Like one might suppose, oh, we should have a weak adjective ending here. But hecha, for some reason, just it eternally exists on its own. <laughs> um, so I, so just bear in mind that normally we would expect a weak adjective um, ending here, which would be what? What's the accusative singular weak adjective ending? An, exactly, an. Um, so if this were a different adjective, it would have, it would have that an ending. Good question. Um, yeah, adverbs are more likely going to be kind of hanging out by themselves, not in the middle of, of some, other, some other phrase or clause. Good question. Others? All right, last one. Um, Cannibalize sentence one space. Um, this is the hardest one. And um, number five is also going to be the hardest one on the exam. <laughs> um, so I designedly tried to give a range of sort of difficulties. Um, and I, so I, wanted, I want us to go through what makes this one harder and why, nonetheless, it should be sort of solvable, as it were. I also want to talk about what the ambiguities are um, that we could um, construe differently. But I'm so parched, I'm going to refill my water very quickly um, while you contemplate that. Oh, for fuck's sake. Never mind. For some reason, I thought there was a water thingy out there. I swear there used to be. Um, I will soldier on. Um, all right, what have we got going on here? Um, who wants to take this one? Phew. 
fewer words than the other sentences, among other things, right? That's part of what makes it harder, actually. You have fewer pieces, you have fewer data points. Yeah, Kenneth? Um, OK, yeah, so I guess first you can identify the verb, which is how, how the. Excellent. And so what, what part of, so what, um, what form is this, and how does that help us? Uh, it ends in out, so it has to be um, present plural. Yep. Good. And then, I guess the only, um, the only plural thing is magas, so that has to be the subject, um, and that means sons. Um, and then, uh, the thing after a verb, tha leod, is a, uh, it could be either nominative or accusative, I think, but in this case it has to be accusative since there's already a subject, so it's the people. Um, and then, fas kiningas. Um, kiningas is a uh, genitive singular because of the es ending. Good. Um, and then, uh, it's kind of weird because that's agreed with Kuningus instead of Magus, which I thought, uh, yeah, I thought that was kind of weird, but I guess the only way you could read it is the king's sons. Yeah, so the reason that Thass agrees with Kuningus is because it governs Kuningus. It's, it's governed by Kuningus. So kinsman of the king. So that's the, that's the reason. Um, and that's one of the things that makes it hard, is that the first, the first noun you see is not actually the subject um, or the object. Um, so you have to use the um, unambiguous nature of this ending, that it has to be genitive singular, either masculine or neuter, but in this case, masculine. Um, you have to use that, that, uh, that unambiguous ending to help parse the rest of it. Um, Ritam, did you have a question? Well, what Saleode and like Tasquiningus Mangas are like plural, so... Sorry? Like, both of the noun phrases are plural and both of them could be either nominative or accusative, right? So, so the, 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 if, you, if you take a look at um, word hoard, um, or I'll just tell you, so Leod, um, and by the way, it's very helpful there's a keyword index to the groups, so it's not quite a, it's not a glossary, but at the back of Word Hoard, um, you can look up particular words um, and it'll take you back to the, um, take you back. So word group 38, laod can be a masculine, a strong masculine noun, meaning man, a plural noun, meaning people, and also <laughs> a feminine noun, meaning a people or nation, right? So you have three quite distinct, I mean, obviously related, but distinct meanings of laod. Um, so you are quite correct that this could be, um, this could be, uh, this could be plural. Um, the, uh, actually, I don't think it can be plural. It has to be feminine singular because if it were plural, yeah, because if it were plural, it would be, it would be leodas. Um, if it were plural, men, right? Um, and if it were feminine, then wait a second. Am I getting myself confused because I'm sleep deprived? That seems entirely possible. Like I, I thought I remembered leode just being. Existing as a separate word in word or just plural. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. It is plural. You're absolutely. Um, you're absolutely right. So that's. Um, so this is. So this is another kind of um, exceptional. It, it, another sort of unusual case um, of where the plural is going to have is going to have that ending. Um, but as I was imagining it in my own head when I was writing it. My intent was that for this to be the um, accusative singular feminine, um, the nation. So kinsman, nominative plural kinsman of the king, 
protect the accusative singular feminine nation. That sentence like makes more sense than like the people or I mean you could also like have the other interpretation, but I guess this makes a little bit more sense. It's really it really comes down, and this is what I mean by idiomatic word order. Um, it really comes down to um, it's really a version of Mike's question about sentence three. Um, it just would it's just would be vanishingly unlikely to have an object, verb, subject, word order in a, a sort of standard Old English sentence. But again, if you if I this this is actually one where um, uh, where again, if you produced that and you could kind of sort of take me through how your grammatical interpretation was correct, however sort of unidiomatic, um, I would absolutely give full points. Um, good. Any questions on that one? So, like, I have a general question. Yeah. Like, on the exam, I feel like or see and like recognize that some sentence has like multiple possible interpretations. Yes. Like try to give what the most obvious interpretation is or like try to give all the possible interpretations that we see. <laughs> so I have tried to write an exam that does not admit of many multiple interpretations for m many sentences, which is to say, um, I hope that you will not be running across that problem on a, on, a, on a frequent or indeed regular basis on the exam. But if that happens, um, I would say, give me as much information as you can give me. Um, and this is actually a really important point about how to take the exam that I want to close on um, before, uh, before we move on to a little bit of um, Alfrich. Um, the reason I've given the reason I made the font so big on the um, on the mock exam is precisely to give you a lot of room to show your work. Okay, so if you do not know the meaning of a word, like so, let's say aodon, you couldn't place what that verb came from, but you recognize that it's plural past. You know it has to be the main verb, just like tell me plural past don't know what it means, and just in your translation have it like verb, like ed or what, however you do it. But just give me as much information as you can, um, and I will give you as many points as I can. Um, there are 10 points for each of these sentences, um, and I'll give partial credit um, liberally, because I know that this is very, very, very challenging to do after literally one month of Old English. Um, I think you all deserve to, um, to be very proud of yourselves um, for, how, uh, for how much you've, you've soaked in um, in a very short amount of time. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Um, other questions before we, um, before we move on? Yeah, go ahead. On the exam itself, like I found that I was flipping back to the very beginning with those tables. Yeah. Translation. Yeah. Is that something we could just do? You absolutely can. So that's a, that's a very good question, Lambert. Yes, no, I, I entirely, uh, you are well within your rights to very quickly, as soon as the exam begins, um, reproduce the paradigms from table one and then use them literally as your crib um, to do, so basically, you would be creating your own uh, abbreviated form of the magic sheet in the first five minutes of the exam, um, and then um, and then use that to to do the site translation. Um, absolutely, it's a great idea, um, and one that I have seen um, others do in the past. Um, and obviously, I mean, the the what takes the lion's share of time on the first closed book section of the exam is this site translation. Um, so you obviously want to be kind of drilled. I would think of the exam as the, your exam prep as having two sort of phases. One is all of the memory work, <laughs> right? The paradigms, the vocab, the grammatical principles. Get all of that down um, as quickly as you can um, so that then you have a good 25 to 30 minutes to spend on the um, uh, on, the, on section four before you go ahead and turn it in and take the timed portion.
portion of the, the assisted translation, where remember, you will need, um, you will need your baker, OK? Um, and this is a good, uh, this is a point of advice I would give, actually. It's easy to, um, one thing I think, one strategic error, or perhaps it's tactical, I can never keep those straight. Um, one error in judgment that I find some students make on the first exam is obsessing about the site translation and kind of trying to get it perfect and then turning it in too late to get a, a good stab at section five of the mock, or sorry, of the, of, of the real exam. <laughs> um, so um, do, I would do your best um, with these, but don't spend, don't obsess to the point that you're spending more um, than the time uh, significantly more than the time allotted, because um, you'll need uh, you'll need the rest of that time for section five. All right. 